Hey everyone, my name is Andrew Davis and you are watching Conversations in Pop Culture brought to you by my sponsor, Mixum Printing, the smarter way to print. I know printing your creative project can be confusing and stressful, but Mixum is here to make it easy. From their instant quote calculator, let you get as many quotes as you want for free to their 24 hour customer service support. Mixum is here to make sure your printing experience runs smoothly from start to finish. And right now you can choose from a range of premium printing options and materials. And the company has also printed so many successful Kickstarter campaigns and a bunch of them you have even heard about on this very show. And they offer services in the United States, Canada, Australia, and the UK. And Mixum can print and reach your audience anywhere in the world. So if you're ready to print smarter, not harder, head over to Mixum.com. And right now, listeners of my show can actually drop my name, Andrew Davis, in the message tab to get a 5% discount on their first order. And if you're running a campaign, every discount matters. Obviously, my, my guest is clearly making fun of me during my entire ad, uh, so I, I appreciate it. I'm trying not to laugh. So that's M-I-X-A-M dot com. Type my name, Andrew Davis, in the message tab of your current order to get a 5% discount on that very first order. And without further ado, I have professional wrestler Kip Stevens with me. So welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. And I wasn't mocking the ad read. I was enhancing the ad read. Hey, 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 they're fine with me doing whatever they want. They gave me no instructions except writing the copy that I then edited. So yeah. clearly, yeah, clearly. But, but you didn't give them the evil Kip option where evil Kip just comes in, takes over and makes everything that much better. Hey, I mean, I mean, I mean, technically you could have interrupted and I would have just let you have it, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, just. Five percent, save five percent, save that five percent. See, I even do music. I am the greatest musician of all time. Behind no Gallagher. On my head. <laughs> oh man, that's just quit on my head. So obviously, if you haven't figured it out, Kip is a wrestler. If you haven't figured it out, <laughs> so be, before we get too far into the three promotions we're going to talk about, and I know your career is a lot bigger than three promotions, but I have a feeling we're going to just get to three. Um, and you've been doing this forever in, in reality as well. I think people don't realize that about you, that you've been doing this a long time. So how did you get into wrestling? Because that's kind of the starting point before we talk about the three promotions. <laughs> All right. Well, forever is a, a bit of an exaggeration, but decade plus, definitely. Um, I want to clarify. Veteran, and I think that's something that people don't realize. And even I didn't realize how long you've been doing this until I started researching, because I've seen your name around for six years, and I'm like, you have like a 14-year career. Yeah, I mean, it's a very long time, and there is a reason behind that. Now, I wanted to clarify the question. Are you talking about how I got into wrestling as a fan, or how I got into wrestling the profession? A little bit of both, because I think they bleed into each other, because I, I, I haven't met a wrestler yet who got into wrestling who wasn't watching as a kid. I will give a spoiler alert. Uh, Chris Statlander, current AEW superstar, one of the best female wrestlers in the world, did not know anything about wrestling. It, but it's saw it a couple times, and then yeah. boom. It is. Oh, definitely. Uh, so I was uh, somebody who loved it when I was younger, uh, When I was since I've been seven years old. Uh, my first memory was right around SummerSlam 1990. Uh, I remember just finally started watching it. And I was hooked, uh, and I've loved it ever since. Uh, so fast forward a bit. Um, I went to a Ring of Honor show in 2004 or 2005. It was All Star Extravaganza 2. And that was the first time I ever saw an independent wrestling show. Like, I always loved WWF, WCW, uh, ECW, but I never knew about independent wrestling. Uh, when I went to that show, I was like, oh, my God, like, I can't be Triple H. I can't be The Undertaker. I can't be Chris Jericho. But I could be this guy, like, because they weren't overly big. They weren't overly tall. And I'm not overly muscular or overly tall as well. And I loved uh, Colt Cabana and the way that his match was just straight up entertaining and kind of like winking at the fourth wall of wrestling. And I was like, this is amazing. I've never seen a, a performance like that. Uh, then eventually I went to a trade show. I was there working and uh, a local wrestling school, NYWC, had a booth set up. 
and you know they were showing off like tapes of their matches and i was talking with their champion at the time dickie rods and you know he was like hey you know you seem like a big fan you should come to one of our shows and i don't know what prompted me to say this i'd be like but i just said oh you know it'd be cool if you guys had a school because that'd be nice to join and i thought i was going to be laughed out like made fun of and said he was like oh wow yeah well if you have a lot of passion you should definitely give it a try and the fact that he didn't discourage me is what prompted me to becoming a professional wrestler. So, so to, to even talk about that, and I got to mention Cole Cabana, because I'm blocked by him on Twitter, and I don't know why. There's take, always I, a reason, Andrew. So, 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 so it, it, I don't think I did anything wrong, but, you know, I, <laughs> it might have been that, that, that maybe I asked him questions about saying, hey, you know, I see you're really doing well with wrestling podcasts, and I was just starting out. And then I asked him a bunch of questions, sort of like in an email slash a DM. And then next thing I know, I'm blocked. So oh. that, that's what I thought it had to do with is that maybe he was like, oh, this guy's trying to enter my territory. And that, you know, I mean, I don't have any will against, you know, anything bad against Coke Cabana. I like Coke Cabana. I'm happy he's in AEW actually making real money. You know, you know, you know I'm, I'm happy for the guy. But like, I kind of sort of when I was starting on my podcast, you know, eight years ago, I was like, hey, who is successful? Let me ask for help. And, you know, unless unless maybe he didn't like a comment when the entire CM Punk interview dropped that I made or something like that. Well, but we'll never know. But um, even to go further into your training, because I had Logan Black on and, and I, we're going to talk about that history because because you and him have have some deep history. Um, oh, but, the, the deepest of darkest. You think black is a dark color. Our history is darker. <laughs> you picked the wrong profession. I'm telling you right now, you should have been writing comics, not wrestling. Um, <laughs> one of the things he said on my show a few, I guess a month and a half ago, is that he said, my job in wrestling is to leave it better and not worse. And that's how it seems that you got into your wrestling school under that mentality, where somebody's mentality was saying, hey, look, my job is to encourage somebody to try to go to a wrestling school and become a wrestler and not mock them for it. And it's a very interesting, you know, sign because some wrestling schools will teach you wrong, will stretch it out, will take your money and then kick you out and teach you nothing after three and a half months of that. And it doesn't seem like you were in that circumstance. Uh, <laughs> uh, there was a little bit of that. I was... You know, there was always a phrase like vetting out. And I was at the very tail end of that where um, it was that old school mentality of, oh, you want to be a wrestler, you have to earn it. And today my mentality, like, I still feel like, yes, if you're a student at a wrestling school, you should earn it. But that doesn't mean you beat the crap out of the kid. That doesn't mean you demoralize them, things like that. Uh, but it does mean, hey, you know, we're going to do some cardio drills and we're going to push each other to make each other better. Um, earning it with me is like, oh, I see one of the students staying late and they're asking me questions. They want to get in the ring and wrestle with me. Um, I see them helping out at shows. Like that right there, those are like little ways that I like to see people earn it. Um, you know, at NYWC, like it was interesting because there was almost like this barrier between like the people who were on shows and people who weren't. Not, and it wasn't like a hardcore, like, who the hell are you, Barrier? But it was, you had to earn it with them. And you want to be in that locker room. You want, and at the time, Trent Beretta was there. Tony Nese was there. John Silver was there. Alex Reynolds was there. Uh, uh, there's so many other names I can mention. The, the next generation is a good way to put it. Definitely. It was a very much a great wrestling school to be a part of at the time. I'm very thankful for where I started. Just like I'm extremely happy of where I am now at Creator Pro. Um, but the whole thing was when I first got there, like it, it, nobody was there. It was pretty much, you had to earn that right to get in that locker room. And I'm grateful for that. Um, nothing was ever handed. You, you really, and plus, trust me, I was very awkward in the ring, you know, clumsy and people weren't like big fans of me at first. Cause I was a little talkative cause I was so nervous, but it was perceived as disrespectful and, you know, I had to like earn, earn my way to like say, no, 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 I really do care. And I really want to get better. And I showed it. And it really meant the world when eventually these people who, you know, would say things like, oh, you know, you know, Kip's a good guy, but he's never going to make it. 
to suddenly becoming their friends and sharing wrestling road trips with them and getting really great advice and having banger matches with them. Like that was a really great experience. And it's something that with like younger students that create a pro now, I try and instill as well. Like, Hey, I'm never going to like mock you or bully you. I'm going to help you out, but I'm not going to go out of my way to do it. You have to show that you want it. And I feel like that's a good way wrestling has evolved a bit. Yeah. It's, it's very much a different environment. Now I've never been in a ring. It would be unsafe for me to be in a ring. You know, I have a physical disability and I'm not going to go and torture myself for, for the sake of everybody and put my health at risk. Um, I am a fan. I understand that I am behind the barrier and not in front of it. Um, what am I doing commentary? I think that'd be a really cool experience. Um, <laughs> just just, just as, as a personal bucket list item, not even as a career. Um, but there is that. And I think it is good, though, that the vetting out and that mentality has ended because obviously it's done a lot of damage. You know, Chris Levin has spoke about this and, you know, he was trained by being stretched out. And, well, you know, I think as we've gotten better in society, I would like to say. And there's, I think, better ways how to train somebody at this point as well. And also wrestling isn't what it used to be either, where there's a lot more cool things that can be done in a ring now that didn't exist before. But I want to basically sum up all your time. And I think, what was it, the first, like, six years of your career was in NY, wow, I'm, I'm blinking out of names. I'm a real NYWC. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Like, 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 like one-seventh of the alphabet. <laughs> clearly, clearly. Like, I am not functioning well today. It's been a long day. Um, but you face people like Tony Nese, Alex Reynolds. I think Mark Sterling had a few matches down there. I think. You oh, know, not when I was not when I was there. To be fair. Fair enough. You might have, but, you might have had him later on. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. But what was it like? Because as we were sort of stating, you really were facing and in the ring with the next generation, with a lot of guys that are now in WWE and are have wrestled in Ring of Honor and are. AEW and really have made names for themselves in like places like Beyond Wrestling and other places that are now well respected. And you were sort of at those people's beginning of their careers. And obviously, when you're facing people who are really now 10 years later, and you're also, you know, 10 years older, and you have to wrestle with them early on, and maybe they were two, three years advanced on you, a lot of knowledge rubs off. And what was that like for you, really getting that experience and then saying, oh, wow, I wrestled those guys in early my career and what they were doing has rubbed off on me to some degree. Yeah, it was really invaluable at, at the time. I, again, just from the names I've mentioned, they've all gone on to do great things. Um, but that school also, uh, Kurt Hawkins and Zach Ryder came from it. Uh, Mike Mondo came from it. Uh, I remember, I think it was like my third ever day of training, like Matt Stryker was there and I was, like, I didn't realize, I knew it was special, but I didn't realize how special it was, the fact that WWE wrestlers are coming out down here on their free time and to pick their brains. Uh, th at the time, there was a lot of cool seminars that I was able to take a take part in. Like, within my first two months, like, Dean Malenko was there. Like, what, what it was really, I, I it didn't, like I said, it dawned on me how lucky I was at the time there. And then, um, again, when you're around people that are better than you at things, you, you have to up your game. Uh, niece is somebody that, you know, he's not going to lower himself to your level. You got to raise your game to get up to his. That doesn't mean I can do nearly the athletic stuff that he does, but I knew it made me learn how to be the best version of Kip Stevens that I can be and do what I do, do it right. Have it make sense maybe throw out something a little bit more flashier than I normally do to show that I'm keeping up. And that's how you create a great match. Cause it styles make fights in a lot of ways. Nice knows how to do Nice. I know how to do Kip and that, that's what created a good match. Same thing with Alex Reynolds. Alex Reynolds can make anybody look good. Um, one guy who I give a lot of credit to for making me a great wrestler, not to say I'm a great wrestler, but somebody who made me feel great about myself was Mike Mondo. Um, so a lot of the trainers left and they brought in Mike Mondo to be the head trainer. And at the time I was helping out Nice and Alex, like just working with beginning chain. And when Mondo came in, he was like, Hey, you know, I, I want you to kind of be under me and help me out with that too. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll be happy to. 
And then Mondo and I formed a really good friendship, and he's the one who um, forced me to get better and to really be a leader in the ring, where it'd be like, hey, have the match with this person. I'm like, well, they only know two moves. Okay, you can still do it, and make it go 10 minutes. You're the heel, and if the match thinks it's all your fault, like, what am I going to do? And then that's when I learned how to be a really, like, well-rounded wrestler and how to, you know, elevate people and, you know, and and do what's right in service of the match. It it took a while for me to get there, but it was so invaluable. And again, like now wherever I go in wrestling, like that's always my attitude is how can I service the match better and how can I service my opponent uh, as best as possible. And then and now, now, now I really want to dive away from one seventh of the alphabet into create a pro because that's where I feel you started to really shine. And obviously I went back on a bunch of matches that, that you had and I didn't see everything. I'm the first person to, to admit that I haven't seen everything that you've done, but how dare you? Yes. Yes. Clearly. How dare I? Maybe, maybe I'm the heel in this entire interview. God, God that's what I've, been t- I've been telling everybody evil Kip is the good guy. They don't realize it yet. So obviously one of the things that happened in Creative Pro very early on is the Breakfast Club with CPA. And, and I love CPA. I love the entire concept of CPA. I love the fact that it's part of the alphabet. Um, I don't trust CPA with my taxes, but that's a different discussion. So how did this come about? Because this entire team didn't just dominate Create a Pro. It was also in Blitzkrieg and a bunch of other promotions. All right. So I'm going to give you the, unf- you know, I'll take off the evil Kip hat for a second and give you a peek behind the curtain. So when I left uh, NYWC, I, I moved to Oregon briefly and then came back. And I knew I needed to change up, you know, my training. And I had a really great friendship with Brian Myers uh, from NYWC, we'd always do secret trainings there, like me and a few other people really would get great workouts in and, you know, formed a friendship. And when I came back, like it was in my head, like I'm going to go to Creative Pro. Um, I want to make sure I'm at the best school possible. And uh, if we want to clip anything out to share on social media over and over again. It will always be that I feel like Creative Pro is uh, the best wrestling school, period. Um, I think the people come out of it. It it just there's so many amazing things I got out of that school and like it really is truly a blessing that I'm there and if you are trying to break into the wrestling business in any way contact Creative Pro do it it will change your life <clears throat> so uh, they were having a show Brian wanted me on it was like yeah sure and he was like you know I think I'm gonna have you team up with the uh, CPA have you ever heard of him I'm like. No, I, well, I knew of him, but I never met him. Like, I knew he was at WrestlePro. And the funny thing is, when Brian told him he was going to team with Kip, he thought Kip as in Billy Gunn Kip. Because <laughs> that's Billy Gunn's real name. Well, we were both, uh, he was disappointed. But, uh, you know, our first match, I thought we clicked really well. We both had, at the time, very similar characters. But like we were different sides of the same coin where he was very timid and meek. I knew that I could be loud and outrageous. And I felt like he could be a little bit more comical and I could be a little bit more outlandish, if that makes sense. Like a little bit more like ah, screaming and going crazy bonkers. And I and as a team, I thought we had really good chemistry. Um, and again, you know, things come and go uh, as far as the team uh i've turned on him in pretty much every promotion and i'll gladly do it again um so before we get to that because that that's the fun part as a team i mean you faced a bunch of different other teams that they're really good massage force which is dorian graves and bsk obviously joe brunson and mjf and you faced mjf in a bunch of different matches and obviously the reason why i'm dropping that is that this was sort of right before mjf exploded and it's a very cool thing to face MJF and really get that experience because, you know, now obviously it's a pain in the ass to find him and wrestle him. There's a few places you could wrestle him in. 
Um, because he does spend a lot of time, I think, in the Northeast at this point. Um, when he's not wrestling for AEW. Um, I live in Bethel. He was just in Danbury, legitimately like a month ago, wrestling, mm-hmm. like right next to the Danbury Police Department of all places. Um, I know the exact arena. I may or may not have been there. I will let everybody figure that one out. Um, but anyway, and then as well as Mark Serling. So what was this like really getting to face some of the best talent on the indies at this point through Creative Pro? Because obviously AEW and other big promotions didn't really exist and weren't where they were supposed to be at, I guess, is where I'm asking. Yeah, I, I mean, particularly with MGF because he was so new, like, uh, you know, you never know how people are going to turn out. But, like, you could tell very early on that he was extremely talented. Uh, and then there were some, like, established names that I had the pleasure of wrestling. And, you know, and then there's hidden gems in wrestling. Like, sometimes you'll go to a place never hearing of somebody and you have an amazing match with them. Uh, it, it's funny how wrestling works like that. Uh, I guess in the grand scheme of things is, I always look at any match I'm in as a blessing because my goal ultimately in wrestling way back in the day was to have just one match. I felt like if I had one match, I, I achieved something I never thought possible. So I've clearly done that multiple times over. Um, and again, like it, it's just, if you go in there with like a closed mind, like we're going to do my match, my way, this is how it's going to happen. Then you're not trying to better yourself. You're not trying to better the profession of wrestling um you're kind of just being a taker in a lot of ways i i look at whoever i'm facing i just want to have a great match for them i want to have a great match for the crowd um if it's somebody new in wrestling i want them to like come out with like man that was like one of my favorite matches oh, i learned so much or like oh man I, I never thought to do it this way and it worked out better uh and if i'm facing somebody more established with me then i'm in that like i want to pick their brain and let's see what we can do together and, you know, make something great for the fans. And, you know, it, when you go in with that attitude, a lot of times that's always going to, that's going to be the case. If you're going with a negative mindset and trying to impose your will, then you're just going to end up frustrated and upset afterwards a lot of the time. And, and speaking about one of the matches I have to talk about, it's you teaming up with Tommy Dreamer, obviously Johnny Class was in there. You know, Joe Brunson, Mark Sterling, obviously facing, and you've had a lot of history with Mark Sterling. MJF was in there, and I think Kurt Stallion was in that match, too. I don't know if Kurt Stallion was. Uh, no, I know exactly who you're thinking of. Yeah, uh, that, was, messed up. that was the Stallion Raleigh Allen. Uh, he is or was a manager at Creative Pro. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, I... <laughs> Well, what was one that more- match like? So you see, I don't get everything right either. So clearly, okay. clearly, but what was that match like? Because obviously Tommy Dreamer, you know, despite despite his comments like three weeks ago, he's one of the greatest wrestlers ever. Everything in his mind is one of the most brilliant wrestling minds in the industry. Um, and getting to be in the ring with an ECW legend and somebody who's gone through WWE and has done work for Impact and runs his own promotion and even getting the opportunity to share a ring. And I'm not too sure if he was wearing polka dots, but <laughs> that, I think he was. He let that one slide. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the fanboy in me was going crazy because I loved watching ECW. I was staying up until one o'clock. Well, started at one o'clock in the morning on the MSG network in New York. And every Saturday night I was there from one o'clock, two o'clock watching it. No, it's not a girlfriend in sight. It was just straight up me and enjoying wrestling on Saturday nights. But that's what I love. So again, I had met Tommy a few times in seminars, but when you have a match with somebody, then you really get to like have a conversation with them and get to know them and, he was really cool. He was receptive to some ideas. Uh, there was one moment in the match where CPA and I did, I always called it like the uh, double decker dive where CPA does this small jump on the people. They all catch him and then I come and then jump on everybody. And then during the match, Jimmy came over to me and goes, Hey, are you okay? Yeah. He goes, cool. That was awesome. The crowd loves it. And right there, it's like, ah, gold star. I can be a happy kid, you know? And, it's moments like that that I'll, I'll always remember. 
and even after the match, he had some very nice things to say to me um, that I, you know, hold in high regard. And again, like, even if it didn't really amount to anything long term, but wrestling sometimes isn't about that. It's about little moments and destinations along the way. And that was a really cool one for me. Yeah, and I thoroughly enjoyed that match. And what I've seen. Oh, thank you. So, 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 because <laughs> I like Tommy Dreamer and it'd be fascinating to have a conversation with Tommy Dreamer. Just be so yeah. interesting. And uh, I'm hoping, I'm hoping one day it'll happen. You know, just, just slowly making my way tearing up. Um, you're just one rung in the ladder. You're on the third mm-hmm. rung in the tall ladder. And there's a title belt at the end. So, so, so <laughs> either that or a Green Lantern ring. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's option A or B. Um, but speaking about titles, you pretty much were involved in the cap tag team titles as well. And I know there was an entire tournament. And then obviously you were sort of rivaling, I think, with massage, you know, force and that and then winning the titles. And what was that like? Because once that happened, I mean, these are some of the best tag team matches that have happened under cap, I feel. And even in wow. the entire idea of tag team, because it was such a good division where you had Massage Force, you had the Warren Cousins, you had the Beaver Boys, which is John Silver and Alex Reynolds, for those who don't know. Um, you obviously had U2 in there, which is the Breakfast Club. And then you have a bunch of other tag teams coming in and out. And it was just such an amazing division. And then you had one final tag team, which was the Shukro, in there as well. And just those matches that you had also for the title and the exchanges – because I think there was like 10 or 15 of these matches in some fashion or another. And these are just wild, wild matches. And then there's also even Stevens was in there and just a variety of other teams over like three years, I think. And so what was that like for you being that the titles were around this and then the titles were not around this and just there was real rivalries that were being built here. And it's a very, very intense moment, I feel, in Russell where it's like, Oh, this is how a division is supposed to run. Yeah, it, it it's really cool. Um, and again, like when you're in the moment, you don't realize it. But yeah, like the ability, it, it didn't, it dawned on me like wrestling massage force is, it's, it's always going to be a great match. Um, and you kind of take for granted how easy it is because it's so, because it clicks, everything works. Uh, same thing like Shook Crew, they were always extremely creative. And it was interesting, like trying to match their creativity at times because not only are they creative, but they're a little outside the box. So it kind of like, you know, stretched me mentally, you know, in a way. And then you had the even Stevens who were very new when they first came in, but we knew that they wanted to be a good tag team. So that was really cool. Um, I, again, like I, there's something about tag team wrestling. That's a lot of fun. And I, I personally love those matches, but sometimes it could be a headache too when you're, doing four way multi-man tag matches. It's like, Oh my, and then, then it gets a little crazy. Um, but you know, somehow some way it all works out and then you can look back on the match and be like, Oh wow, it was great. Um, that, that's Blitzkrieg's thing doing four man multi tag matches or four way elimination matches. They tend to do a lot of those. Yeah. And I've been in a lot of them. And again, like, again, like the, the, Wrestler and me, like, I mean, I would love to be singles wrestler having 20 minute matches every time, but that's not always the case. And, you know, even at Blitzkrieg teaming with Juba, like, that was something I wasn't expecting, but I like it. It's a cool dynamic. We're going to talk about that, I promise. (laughs) Yes, we can't leave out Juba. But, uh, I refuse to leave out Juba. But, but, but sticking with CPA, because we, before we get to the breakup, because, because that, that, that's, that's the most interesting stuff, because there's some intense matches. You also had a ladder match with, with him, not teaming up with him. And what was that like? Because I think that's your only ladder match you've been involved in. And yeah, ladder match is scary as AF, you know, mm-hmm. because things can go wrong in ladder matches. You know, I don't think anybody who's watched enough wrestling knows the, the famous ladder match with Joey Mercury. And that was a nasty position. I think it's one of the most, like, deadliest, not, not deadliest because nobody died in that match, but that was a nasty match in a lot of ways. And so what was that like for you having a ladder match? Because there's a lot of people involved in that match. Obviously, Massage Force and then also the closers with just Brad Hollister and Hammer Tunis, I want to say. 
Yeah. Um, I liked it, a lot of times in the indies, it's hard to get involved in storylines. A lot of times it's just random match and you just have a good match. Hopefully. <laughs> um, that was really cool how it kind of organically happened where each team won a match. It was always three way tag matches. And then they're like, all right, we're going to do a blow off in a ladder match. And I was never in one, but it was cool because uh, it was a story that fans really got invested in. They really enjoyed. Uh, it was three teams that, you know, were, were well liked by the fans, like, you know, Tunis and Hollister definitely have a really strong connection up in that new England area. Uh, Massage force was like that outside the box, weird, but super entertaining and athletic. And then you have the ultimate clean cut, good guys trying to like roll up their sleeves for these titles. It was a, a really great feud. Um, and again, like the element for danger is in every ladder match, but the element for creativity is there too. And, you know, you, you're going to you drive home a little sore that day and be sore the next day. And Lord knows I had many marks on my body from it, but uh, all in all, like, you know, as long as the fans went home happy and, you know, the, the pay was on point, you know, <laughs> you know, it was, those are the overall I, I really can't complain and that was it was i was glad i got to do a ladder match in my career and hopefully i'm blessed enough where like i get involved in another storyline that's equally as good and they feel like oh you know we'll do a ladder match or another spectacle match like uh, if you're doing one of those spectacle matches it usually means because you're involved in a good storyline and people are invested in it, it so it's, it's a compliment things, it's one of the things where i have an issue with deathmatch wrestling because they, when, when you start bringing in light tubes and you start bringing in tables and you start bringing in ladders and chairs and any other weapons and cheese graters, if every match has it, how do you raise up the temperature? If all of a sudden a match doesn't have it, I'm like, this is now lowering the temperature and now it stands out on the card a little bit more. And that's one of the things that I have an issue with ICW, not, not, uh, No Holds Bar. Used to be New York, now, now it's No Holds Bar, is that like, I appreciate the change, and I appreciate everything you guys have done. And I like some aspects of deathmatch wrestling because it's insane, and it's brutal, and it's amazing sometimes. But at the same time, it's like every match starts blending together at a certain point. When you have a ladder match, and it's at the end of a card, or it starts to card off, that match stands out. And it's, that, that's just a personal preference. And maybe I'm comic book spoiled. And that's how I feel, where issue one is supposed to have a tone and issue three cannot have the same tone as issue one. Issue six has to have a, the same tone as issue one in a lot of ways. Maybe I'm a spoiled, you know, child, you know, a, a, a spoiled 28-year-old, I will say, who acts like a five-year-old child when he's in a comic book shop. Um, but I digress because I want to talk about relationships and in particular yours and CPAs because the breakup happened and you sort of spoiled it already. But you've turned on him in almost every single promotion. You turned on him in Creative Pro. You turned on him in Blitzkrieg. There's a, probably a few more that are not on this list that you've turned on him. And even if you guys were not in the same promotion, you probably turned on him without even knowing it. So why? Why? That, 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 that's the only question we have. We need to know the answer today. So now we put on the evil Kip face. Why do I have to tell you anything? Why do I have to justify my decisions? Why does everybody want an explanation? Why, why, why? The why is not important. All that's important is that you should trust an evil Kip. CPA is a fraud. CPA has an identity crisis. Was he, is he Nick Stapp this month? Is he? Or is he back to CPA? Who knows? I don't know. We, 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 we don't know. I don't, and I don't care. Quite frankly... One thing was that I empowered myself. I am no longer shackled down. I'm no longer being held down by anybody or anything. And I couldn't be happier. So even though I am evil Kip, you know, everybody calls me evil Kip. Oh, you're evil Kip. Blah, blah, blah. You know why? Because I finally started standing up for myself. It was, I'm no longer under anybody else's shoe anymore. And everybody got offended. Oh, now he wants to stick up for himself. Well, yeah. And not only am I sticking up for myself, I'm going to keep on doing it. And if that makes me evil, then then I'm evil. 
And, 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 and even to talk about this, because in wrestling, you know, it's not therapy. You settle your problems in a ring. And there was quite a few matches. Physical thought, therapy. Yes, yes, physical therapy. And not, not, not the one you go into a doctor's office for before the match. You might go mm -hmm. after the match. But I digress right there, too. Um, but obviously, there was a bunch of matches between the two of you. And one of them involved a chain. And it was a very intense match. And it was a very, very, you know, spectacle match, for lack of a better word. So what was that like, having that match? And also having, because at this point now, we're not talking a month of, of, of you guys teaming up. We're talking years of you guys teaming up in real history and people knowing whether, depending on obviously storylines change and things like that, sort of breaking a little of the kayfabe here, but people obviously were sort of expecting the two of you to be on the same team and now you're not. And now you're having a real deciding factor saying we're gonna settle this and one of us is gonna be getting the victory and that the feud's gonna be somewhat over. Yeah, I, I personally hate chain matches because the chain gets all mangled and caught up and it gets clunky and you're tripping on it. Um, but yeah, like the rivalry necess uh, necessitated that uh, it, to go to it, that extreme. It a focal point where, where mm. this was the climax of the story in a lot of ways, where this was the moment that okay, this is the end of the story or the beginning of the next book, essentially, where this is kind of, we're at that stage where now this is the perfect time to do it. Yeah, and I thought it was a, a cool way to end the feud. And let the record show, I won that match. So I, w I went to the evil extremes. And um, yeah, like, again, anytime you're going into a match, uh, friend or foe or former friend like there was one part in there where I was holding the chain and I was debating if I really want to go through with it because at the end of the day there was a lot of past history and at the end of the day I mean if I snuff out CPA does anybody even really care so I'm like do I do I want to go with this and I was had that sliver of doubt and then I decided you know what let's just do it and see what happens and guess what? I welded him with that chain, and they and just that's the end. Goodbye, CPA or Nick Staff or whoever you are. I don't even care anymore. Goodbye. Go home. And, and, and obviously, this this birthed a, a, a new character and a new position for you, Evil Kip. And uh, you got thrown into really being a singles wrestler for a little while. And you got involved in the Cap TV title, dealing with Mark Sterling, obviously dealing with Max Caster, and then a variety of other people as well. You know, obviously having a bunch of, you know, handicap matches against the Even Stevens for the vacant, I think, Cap Tag Team titles, and obviously facing a lot of Bobby, you know, Orlando and Balls of Steel, which... You know, br brilliant name, brilliant name for 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 that entire. And let the record show, my balls are steel. Hey, you know what it is? There's Metal Mario too, so I'm not here to judge. You know, I'm just I'm just here to 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 report an interview. What you do in your free time is up to you, and what you do to your body is your choice. Um, <laughs> so so I'm just gonna let you know on that, and also having a dime piece also is, is a very interesting match as well with Aaron Rourke. And uh, again, what you do, because a timepiece is something else, I'm just going to say. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I don't know what it means. I just beat him up. I love Aaron Rourke. I love Aaron Rourke. I was very upset that he decided not to show up for Butch for a score. I was very upset about that. I was <laughs> very upset. But, 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 but it, it like broke my heart in two. Um, but anyway, what was it like really getting to face a lot of these guys and these people? Because these matches really, I felt, show what you do as a single wrestler for the first yeah. time in your career. I, yeah, I appreciate that. Well, it was the first time in, in, a, in a while. When I came back uh, to, to New York and then joined Creative <laughs> Pro, it was you know primarily tagging with CPA. Um, but, you know... 
I'm not saying this in a bad way, but very few people get into wrestling to, I want to be a tag team wrestler. No, everybody wants to be the star. And, you know, it was, it was like the next part of like, all right, you know, I'm excited to do some singles now. It was a change of pace. It was, it was really exciting to like have that creativity again. Um, and that's one thing that Cap TV is great with is having that outlet and having a lot of different opponents to face and, you know, getting to show off that side. Um, I mean, I, I, all the names you mentioned, I could say plenty of good things about. And, you know, I'll just say they're not better than me. <laughs> but it it's good to have those opportunities. And I'm grateful for them. And that's why if anybody's watching and wants to, you know, have that perspective, like watch Cap TV. Like every week there's awesome matches on there. And please search out my matches because uh, even some as, you know, one tough nerd Kip Stevens. Uh, I had some really, ma- really great matches in there with, uh, you know, Mike Anthony was somebody who whose name isn't mentioned in a lot of places yet, but one day it will be. Uh, so, I, you know, that's what I really like about Cap TV and having those opportunities. And, and even going further, obviously, you got to wrestle Ryan Mayers and injured Hassan at this point. Because, 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 womp, it, it, it's Dan Hassan, everybody. He, he's injured, so to actually go buy the, his shirt. Um, and uh, you were with Johnny Clash on that match, I think. And so, what was that like? Because I don't know if you got to wrestle Brian before, but it's also very cool when you know you're wrestling somebody who's running that promotion, gave you an opportunity to wrestle at Create a Pro, and then you know. Somebody who's been in WWE, I think Brian's an impact, right? He has an impact contract, right? I, I just want to get this straight because Zach or, or Matt now has um, uh, a AEW contract. So, and obviously impact and AEW trade talent all the time now. So obviously, what was that like to get to wrestle and share the ring with both those guys? Because they've done some of the most amazing things in both talent and character. I think it's hands down. Dan Hassan is arguably one of the best character wrestlers ever. Yeah, I, you know, ever is a strong word, but I agree that Dan Hassan uh, has definitely tapped into the wrestling zeitgeist, and wrestling fandom is very much behind him. And it's, you know, as something that again that show sold out and. I'm under no disillusions. The major reason is because of Dan House. Uh, you know, and anytime you can be in the ring with somebody who's tapping into something like that, you're going to learn from that experience. And same thing with wrestling Brian Myers. That man is a wealth of wrestling knowledge. So just being in the ring with him, you're going to get better. You're going to learn. You're going to... Um, up your game, so to speak. And, and again, like if you don't get that excitement or that rush, you're, you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong art form. The, the uh, saying is that I used to work in DC and I went to the white house for, for an event um, for my job and I'm walking through and I wasn't in the, I was in the building next to the white house, the executive, you know, I was in our office building, but it's sort of part of the white house technically. And I'm walking through and there's a real rush and you understand when you're going through it and you're there for work and you're there for policy issues. You're like, Oh, you know, this is a very different thing. And the second you realize where you're not in, in DC and that you're not in and you literally, you are 70 feet away from the white house, the West wing, you got to leave DC at that point. It doesn't matter what party you're in. If you don't understand and recognize the power of it and where you're at, you don't belong in that area anymore it's kind of like you look up at the lincoln memorial and you don't recognize it you gotta sort of check yourself it is a really good way to put it and so that's something that i think some people understand and some people don't it's, it, it's a very weird concept to describe mm-hmm. yeah i mean i can i can only imagine i've been to dc a couple times and it really is um it's kind of cool like I, i've said this about like certain cities in a 
on the, especially on the East Coast, like like Boston and Philadelphia, you can feel the history in the streets, if that makes sense. And DC is kind of one of those places too, when you're like, you might be walking through a modern building, but you're looking at something very important there's, in front of you. Also in DC, there's a lot of cool things that when you get to know the city, there's the tourist city and then there's the local city. And the local mm -hmm. city will blow away the tourist city any day. I don't live in DC anymore may or may not run for Senate at some point, and I will win a seat. Um, I will make Connecticut red, white, and blue. Oh, oh <laughs> in, in my, my term of office. Um, <laughs> but but, but I, I digress, and I, I, I'm joking aside. Um, the, the whole thing is that I would imagine that's what it's like to be in with Brian and Dan Housen in a lot of ways. Yeah. Just and massive history and knowledge and skill sets that don't sometimes come into a wrestling ring. And not to disrespect anybody, but like, you know, no, we, it, want when, to, we want to, absolutely. But, but again, like, it was the same feeling with Tommy Dreamer. Like, wow, I'm wrestling somebody who I watched when I was a fan, what, like, in high school watching TV. Or, uh, you know, any, anytime it was like a, a name, an old school name like that, it was like, wow, this is I mean, pretty wild. I never thought I'd get. I don't know if you, remember, if you remember the Edgeheads, right? Yeah, of course. That's Brian and Matt with with, yeah. with Edge, and it's brilliant, and and it was it was great. It was it was amazing, and it's crazy for me to see these guys saying, "Wow, I came into wrestling during when that started." So I came in during the John Cena Edge feud, and I got really big into it, like for the next three years. And the Edge head was like, "This is an awesome team. It's so just perfect." Like, and, and so now what I'm seeing like both Matt and Brian Russell and in their prime, you know, in a lot of ways and doing really amazing things. I'm just like, wow, this is so interesting to see how people have progressed. And it just blows my mind as a fan. And I can't imagine what it's like to be in the ring with these. And a, and, and a peek behind the curtain at Creative Pro training sessions, uh, Brian will share things, but every now and again, he'll be like, Edge taught me this or Edge mentioned this, like, it's really cool in a way because like some of the advice that you're getting is advice that edge gave to him. So in a way it's like almost like edge is talking, you know, through Brian to us. And it's something that's like pretty wild, especially when you like, I've admired edge as much as I have, you know, no, no, it's a, it's, it's a wild thing. And, and obviously I enjoy cap as much as a lot of other people enjoy cap. And I think I think that there's just amazing things that that Cap's doing, and I also like the fact that they do have a TV deal and that it is very accessible, because that that's something that is difficult for me is that wrestling sometimes is not accessible, and Cap has made it that it's accessible, and that's very helpful because if a product isn't accessible, you have the greatest product in the world, but if I can't watch it you know, I'm not going to watch it. You know, it, it's it's just logic. And, you know, we're going to talk about comics in a little bit. And <laughs> that's the whole problem with comic books right now. But I do need to mention forming the CDC and not the Center for Disease Control. <laughs> I, I want to make that crystal clear before I get in trouble with everybody. Um, and that was with pretty much you, Juba, I think, you know, Wrecking Ball was in there and a few other people have come in and out of that to some degree. And I think Devontae's has been somewhat in that as well. And I love Devontae's. He, he, he started off my season too in January. So uh, I enjoy him and I, I want to get back on because he's a monster. He's a beast. Um, you think about Solo Darling training Devontae's. That, that that's an image for for everybody to imagine. Um, but 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 he he spoke about it live on my show, so so it's all right if I mention that. I don't think Solo is going to mind me saying that either. Um, but what was this like forming this team? Because this is a unique team in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's a it's a great opportunity for me to be a, a little bit of a rat and a sneak, which is awesome. Uh, I like surrounding myself with people much bigger, taller, and muscular than me. Because <laughs> that leaves all the looks to me, which is great. Uh, and again, uh, Alex Cypher, I feel, is an extremely underrated manager. And I feel, you know, I can understand it's a wrestling business. And 
everybody that you bring in is an expense. But uh, Alex Cipher is somebody that I wish would be at more promotions because he is a very good manager. He is Killer Kowalski trained, and he just is there for everything that you need him to be. Uh, unlike a lot of other places I've gone to where the managers are just kind of there and they miss their cues, and it's frustrating. Um, it's fun having a group like that. It's tough because we're all kind of scattered about. I wish there was a little bit more cohesion, but I think as a stable, as a family, uh, we're untouchable. And, and one of the things, and obviously I thoroughly enjoy Logan Black, and Logan Black's been on my show a bunch of times, and obviously he has the Apostles of Chaos, and this is a huge feud that's been going on. And there, there's like a real war. And, you know, obviously. Yeah, and guess yeah. what? Your little bunkhouse match, Logan Black, I wasn't there. Ooh, whoop de doo. You couldn't get your revenge. Wah, wah, wah. Go home, cry. But, 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 but for, for those who don't know, you know, Logan, and, and I've said this before, and, and Rip Bison, I, I'd Rip Bison and Perry on Vicious on, and, and I like both of them. I had a rip on with Downey, of all people. That was so cool. It's because I love Downey XO too. Um, I want to get Ashley Vox, and, and you might have problems with her, which I understand. You know, she did not deserve that win. She clearly cheated. Is the official position correct? Of course. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just making sure. So, 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 so <laughs> having said that, um, Logan and Chris are really big guys, and the, I mean, Chris, Chris looks big. Logan does not look big, and Logan is a big guy. And, and, and I say this not to be disrespectful or to, you know, take anybody's shots, but you can't push those guys around. And so what was this like really wrestling them? Because obviously you had Devontae's in one of the matches, you had Juba in another match. And obviously you're, as you stated, not exactly super muscular and big like they are, but it creates a very interesting match. Yeah. And that's where we go back to styles make fights. Um you know, Logan Black is somebody who, you know, my might, might not like him. Uh, I, I, there's a certain, you get in the ring with some people and there's chemistry and it clicks right away. And Logan Black is one of those guys for me. Um, I can wrestle him seven days a week, 365, and enjoy it. And he's also deceptively strong. Uh, granted, you know, like he throws me around. That's how I know. <laughs> but, you know, he's a good dude. Uh, in, when in the ring, and again, like his mantra about wrestling and about life, uh, he is a very positive person. And this is where I'll take off the evil kip face for a second. Uh, I've had plenty of conversations with him, and I like just there's people in wrestling that like you could see yes. yourself being friends with them, even if you weren't in wrestling. And he's one of those people for me. He he has evil a kip face back on, he's, he but he's the worst. Very very different mentality about wrestling. And yeah. it's very important. And obviously, if you listen to my interview with him, you'll understand. And, you know, I'm just going to throw it at that, not to dive too deep into it, but super interesting conversation. And uh, Go to the archives and listen. I, hey, I need, the promo. I need the promo. I need, I need the promo. I'm you. Use and uh, give me the way my day is going. I need all the love I can get and love and money. So having said all that, um, you know, that, that's all I'm going to say on that point. But go listen to that interview if you haven't, because it's an amazing interview. Um, and then, obviously, there's one more thing I kind of want to talk about before we talk about comic books, because that's my favorite topic to talk about. And uh, because, obviously, Cap, Brian, is connected to WWE, and, obviously, Cap is located, sort of centrally located for, for those, especially in the Northeast. Um, you've got a bunch of WWE opportunities. And... You know, two of them. And what was that like to face Eric Rowan and Heavy Machinery? Because obviously being out in front of a bunch of people, seeing you at that point, I knew who you were. I'm like, oh, snap. Kip Stevens is on TV. Oh, snap. Hmm. This is fascinating. And I was like completely like overjoyed. I'm like, oh, my God, I know who this is. It was kind of like when I saw Casey Cattell on Raw 2. And Lady Frost was on Raw, I believe. At one point, so I'm like, "Oh snap! I know all these people. This is amazing." So, what was that like for you? Just even getting the uh, opportunity. 
Yeah, surreal. Um, and one person who doesn't get enough credit for those opportunities is Pat Buck, who is a current WWE producer. Um, so whenever he's on TV, I'm going crazy for him just as much as you are for any of us. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I've done a bunch of WWE extra work and it's been a blessing. And even if I do nothing there, I'm still grateful that I'm there. You know, even I get to eat free food for a day and, you know, see how the sausage is made, so to speak. It's uh, also, and every- isn't it also the fact that, you know, because I think Drew McIntyre was speaking about this, saying as long as you're in the company, anything could happen. Meaning that you might be walking down the hallway and Vince might be on the other side. And then Vince says, kid, over there, I've got this great idea. And like all of a sudden, you know, it might very well be that you're thrown into something just because you were at the right place at the right time and something popped into somebody's head. And as long as you're at least somewhere in the vicinity, you know, and I'm not saying it happens like that, but I think Drew McIntyre was speaking about that on Jericho's podcast. And it's a very, very important point to make. And I don't think it just applies to WWE. I think it applies to life. But sorry, yeah. can continue. No, no, it's okay. And and again, like, it is very unlikely that that scenario that you just laid out will happen. But in the next breath, nobody thought James Ellsworth would have been a thing either. So, it, like you said, you you never know. And I don't take those opportunities for granted. You know, I go there, you know, and I'm ready to serve however they need me to. If it means I'm in the background for a shot when somebody's walking by, that's my role. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. If I'm lucky enough to have a match on TV, then all the more I am going to give them exactly what they need that day and, you know, be thankful for the opportunity. Um, And again, like when we talked about original goals, just one match, like wrestling for WWE wasn't even something that I considered. I never thought it was something that would happen. I never thought it would be in the cards for me. But again, the fact that it did it twice just blows my mind. And it's something that, again, will never be taken away from me. It's something that if wrestling, you know, if, if you know, wrestling gods come down and say, hey, guess what? You can't wrestle anymore. I'd be crushed, devastated, hurt, heartbroken, and miss wrestling so much. But I can always look back and be like, wow, but that's something that I never thought possible. And I was blessed I got to do it. And again, all because of Creative Pro. Like, if I, you know, I, I give them all credit for putting me in the right position to succeed. And hopefully I made the school proud those times. That was my number one goal more than anything. Yeah, that, that that's important because I think people don't understand that they represent, I think a lot of wrestlers, especially young wrestlers, don't rep- understand that you're representing your school when you go places. And that if you act like an asshole, you know, at a promotion, you know, A, people pay attention to it. I think there's a change in mentality with booking people. You know, I mean, I think I could say it very openly that tell me and rip with their promotion. It's not just talent anymore. It's more than talent where it's also, do you show up on time? What's your attitude towards people? How do you respond to people? How do you treat fans? How do you actually engage? You know, who's trustworthy? Who actually deserves an opportunity? And talent isn't the deciding factor. I mean, you need to be good, but you don't need to be, I don't think, the best in their promotion. You need to have all the other skills, too. And yeah, they'll, they'll never use me then. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but it's the idea that are you going to show up on time? You know, and all that stuff really matters. I think, are you professional? You know, if do you yell at fans? And you snap at fans. I've had wrestlers snap at me on certain issues on Twitter. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I've had people from Ring of Honor snap at me. And I'm like, I didn't say anything offensive. You know, if I say a wrestler's money, then you say they're all money. And you snap at me, congratulations. You know, that's probably not the best mode when somebody's not doing any harm to you. But I, but I digress right there. Um, so, so, so having said all that, and there's a million other things we could talk about with wrestling, but I am curious your thoughts on where do you think wrestling is going? Because obviously the last 22 months have been a very interesting time in the world. And I, it, wrestling obviously didn't operate. 
You know, the last show I went to was Bush for a score with Primetime, which we don't have to talk about. I'm not thrilled with them either. They owe me money. Um, but the, the, the whole thing is that that was the last wrestling show I went to. And then wrestling didn't exist for like seven months. And then it came back in the summer of 2020. And then it disappeared. And then it's on and off. And things are getting kind of crazy. So I'm curious where you view it all going, where the adaptation is, and even what can be done in wrestling. Now, given how you just went through a big pandemic that is sort of complicated still. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> and that's the million dollar question. I wish I knew. Um, I, I obviously am thrilled that there's another major company with AEW. Uh, I like that Impact is still bringing in new talent and always looking to elevate their game. Uh, the Ring of Honor news is heartbreaking, and I hope that whatever they decide to do going forward, it's it's complicated. But what's going on? I don't know. I don't know how much you know about what what's going on with Sinclair. I I don't, and I'm I, I'm not going to speculate, or I don't want to like. So so what, what's going on supposedly is that they have about twelve point five billion dollars of debt. Now, the, the, the question that becomes is that, um, is that good debt? Is it bad debt? Is it serviceable debt? So that, that, that's where it gets complicated because Apple has more than $12.5 billion as a company, but Apple is servicing that debt. So I don't really know what's going on with all of that either, but I also think that a lot of it is somewhat hyper blown out they're saying, oh, they're going to sell Ring of Honor. Um, I don't know beyond that. I think it's not good, but I think that that it's overhyped personally. Mm -hmm. And again, I I don't know. I'm not going to speculate, but I hope that whatever happens to Ring of Honor in the future, uh, it still creates opportunities for people to wrestle. Um, again, I, I think that there's enough talent out there for another major promotion but there has to be somebody with the financial means to want to do it. Uh, one thing I, I think I think would be really cool is if they, if a streaming service got involved and they want to have their own wrestling promotion. Netflix. I don't, the, mm -hmm. I don't know how like the contracts would work. I don't know how like the financials would work, how the advertising would work, but I do feel like there is an, another opportunity for a major promotion to be out there. Um, so if any billionaires are listening and you want to enroll in my services, I will be glad to sign aboard, be one of your first wrestlers slash consultants slash just give me the monies and I will talk to you for that reason. Um, again, I, I personally you know, hope that the wrestling business is strong and it stays strong and it continues to grow and prosper uh, for everybody. Uh, that's the ultimate goal is because I want a job in wrestling I know that there's a lot of other people who want a job in wrestling and hopefully there's more jobs in wrestling so we can do that. And so we're, we're going to end with the wrestling stuff right there, but we do have to talk about comics because you have a Green Lantern tattoo and you might have a Batman one too. I do. I, I didn't know if it was like a Batman Cthulhu tattoo or if it was just a bat symbol because it's a little hard to see it sometimes. I'm the first person to, you know, but what's the story behind your love for DC Comics and everything that's going on with that because I love Green Lantern. When I was lying in a hospital bed recovering from a surgery, I read All the Blackest Night and Fear Itself back to back. And uh, I'm, I've been thrilled with Green Lantern and I think Blackest Night is one of the greatest comic books to come out in the last 20 years. Um, so obviously I'm curious how you got into Green Lantern, DC Comics and all that stuff because that, that that that's the important part of this interview. Yeah, so <laughs> when I was little, like you know, I'd pay, I'd get comics every now and again, and I thought, oh, okay, cool. Then um, when I got into college, I started really getting heavy into them. The first Spider-Man movie with uh, Tobey Maguire was coming out. I'm like, oh, you know yeah. what? I should read some. Yeah, great movie. Uh, and then my best friend in the world, who's also a comic book author, Jay Hewer. Uh, me and him were working together and we started forming a friendship and he was into comics and I'd be like, what are some things I should read? And again, he was almost like a drug dealer recommending me things and it just grew and grew and grew. And I always liked the Green Lantern symbol 
because uh, Hurricane had it, the wrestler. Um, funny sidebar, when I did my match against Eric Rowan, he like was backstage. He's like, oh, good job. And I was like, oh, hey, uh, you know, sorry about the Green Lantern tattoo. He goes, oh, don't worry about it. I've been getting a lot of tweets about that. <laughs> and I was cracking up. Um, but yeah, I like the symbol. So I got that done. Uh, the Batman one was done randomly. I was in Virginia. I was bored and I was with friends and they went to a tattoo shop and they're like, oh, well, I'm going to get one. I'm like, well, I might as well get one too. So I saw it on the wall. I'm like, oh, cool. I'll get that. And then uh, I also have the Daredevil DD. See if I can get that on. Ah. I can make you full screen. I can make you full screen. Yeah, I'm trying to do it right now. You know, I one have that one sec. I'll make you full screen right now. Yeah. Yeah, we can. There we, we can go. See there we go. There we go. Yep, there we are. So I have the DDs on my forum, which everybody asks me what it means. So I always joke around saying, oh, it's whatever you think it means. Dunkin' Donuts or, you know, designated I driver. Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts is good. <laughs> yes, does, doesn't drink. You know, I always think of something clever for the two Ds. Um, yeah, it was just something that, like, you know, I was so into comic books and the idea of like believing in yourself was something really cool about Green Lantern. The idea of having no fear was something really cool about Daredevil. And Batman is just something that, you know... We, we all uh, want to be a billionaire playboy. <laughs> yes, we all want to be a billionaire playboy. I'll leave it at that. So, so, you so, know, so, so, so to even talk about this, because I am way more into comics. For, for those two who have seen the graphic for this entire thing, you know, my title is podcast host, comic book investor. I buy and sell comics. I legitimately just shot out an offer to somebody on eBay for a comic book that I would like to sell them that I got today. So legitimately my carry time is going to be like 16 hours on the book, which is crazy. Um, and then I sort of shorted it because I actually bought the book back cheaper, but that's a whole different discussion. Um, yes, you could short a comic book. Um, <laughs> it's so interesting, but I am curious where you think comics are going because I know that you've been out of it for a while, but yeah. obviously with you know really cool movies coming out and intellectual, I guess, property and all that stuff. You know, I'm curious to your thoughts on the entire comic book market, whether that's television or however you want to address it. I'm open to because Disney Plus is pretty cool. AT and T with HBO Max has got some good stuff, but also Eternals looks really wonky. It looks like everything that a Marvel movie is not supposed to be. Uh, yeah. And again, like this is coming from a very uninformed opinion. Uh, I stopped collecting when I started wrestling training just because it was either fun, my dream or fun to read comic books. And again, I'm not, you know, if you made the decision to keep reading comic books, that's awesome. I support you wholeheartedly. Um, my perception totally from the outside looking in is that, comic book characters are more popular than ever, but I don't know if comic books are, because I feel like people like are now satiating themselves through movies. Like Back in the day, it's like, oh, I like Captain America, you'd read the comic book. Now, I like Captain America, I will go to the movie theater and see a Captain America movie. Or I will boot up my video game console and I can be Captain America in a video game. Or, or uh, you can wear a Captain America t-shirt or a Batman t-shirt where it's cool to have the brand of Batman on you. First. Exactly. And, and what, what, what's happened, for those who are interested, is that um, DC and Marvel, to some degree, are shrinking now. Or that, that's the perception and a lot of people feel. I think they're actually growing. And I think they're, they're, they're very smart. I think they know exactly what they're doing. And I think they just know where the money is. Um, Disney is a almost $200 billion company. AT&T is also a $200 billion company, give or take. Um, AT&T owns DC Comics, for those who, who don't know that. Um, Disney obviously owns Marvel. So you're dealing with big companies that make up, you know, collectively $400 billion plus dollars in market share. And then you have other companies like IDW and a few others that are publicly traded. Uh, Tencent owns some comic stuff. And so you have about $450 billion worth of comic books out there. But the real value in a lot of these companies is the characters. But what's growing massively is the indie comic world. And that is a whole different ballgame. So it's very interesting where 
it, it, it's tricky to figure out what's worth money in comic book investing, but I personally invest in variants and covers that at 500 issues or a thousand issues out dated out, I guess, or, or granted, or there's only a thousand copies of a book because I know there's only a limited number. It's, it's a very interesting field, but everybody has a perspective and you're more right than wrong because yeah. it, it's clearly where what's what dictating the market. So super ultimately, ultimately the only thing I hope that continues is that stories are still pumped out because at the end of the day, like, yeah, I, it's cool to collect comic books, but I hope people aren't just collecting them to keep them in a bag and look at them. I hope people are, you know, taking the time by that second issue to like, thumb through it, you know, appreciate the artwork, appreciate the storytelling, appreciate where the character is going and the stories that are provided to you because, you know, you can get a lot of great entertainment value out of, you know, uh, a nice comic book. Well, now, now when you're spending like $300 for it, that thing goes right into the uh, back, right into the back. No question. I, yes. I agree. But there's plenty of those uh, 299ers, 399ers that, you, that you'll love what's in side what, what, what i like reading is i like reading digital so you can go buy a comicsology subscription for six dollars and 37 cents every single month and you can get granted access to about ten thousand comics and new ones are being added every single month and so when i'm laying at 11 o'clock at night i turn on my lights and for the next hour and a half i'm reading comics on my ipad off of amazon so if anybody wants to read comics, that's the way to do it. I encourage you to go spend your $6.37. I do not get a kickback from Amazon. If I did, that would be amazing. That'd be amazing if I did. Um, but, but it's the cheapest way how to read comics right now on the mainstream level. But uh, yeah, no, definitely. I figured we would talk about it. Obviously, I love DC Comics. I am born and bred in DC Comics, first and foremost. The only comic I want to write is Teen Titans West, because I already know what I would do with them. Um, I do not want to touch the regular Teen Titans. They bore me to death. Um, I have the plan, and Bumblebee is going to be the team captain. So it's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. So having said all that, and uh, in issue three, her and Cyborg will kiss. It'll be a great panel. Got the entire thing planned out. Cyborg will make a trip out to Cali, in Los Angeles for Titans West Tower. It's gonna to be an amazing scene. Um, so when DC calls me and says, Andrew, Bright Teen Titans West, we got six issues for you. I'll say, I'll do it for free. Um, <laughs> having said that though, enough about me, because this is about you, which means it's really about me. Um, what would Evil Kip like to promote? <laughs> uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, well, Twitter and Instagram, I recently changed my handles to I am Evil Kip because I am Evil Kip. Uh, Facebook, it's still Francis Kip Stevens because they wouldn't let me put evil as my first name. Unbelievable. What are you going to do? Uh, you know, I at shows, I sell merchandise. I do not have a pro wrestling tease, but I should get on that, I guess. I am very computer illiterate. Uh I don't like interacting with people. I don't like the Twitter. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> like, please it, interact with me on there. If you want a shirt, I will gladly sell you a shirt on there. Uh, but maybe I'll get on a website one day and do all that stuff. I might as well. I'm probably leaving money off the, on the table. Yeah, you probably are. <laughs> I have a pro wrestling tease and I'm not a wrestler. So everybody, if, if we get, Five people say, get on Pro Wrestling Tees. I will take that as 5,000, and I will do it. But uh, I want to see an interest. Yeah, so, 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 so go, go bother him to get on Pro Wrestling Tees. Force him to open up a Pro Wrestling Tees and actually put up designs and make it so that it's very easy to... I'll put up retired designs, and I will and I will incentivize this as well. If, you, if everybody influences me to get on there, I will throw up an exclusive Pro Wrestling Tees design that can only be purchased on Pro Wrestling Tees. That'll be something I will do for all my fans, all five of you who are listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 you heard it first. So, so obviously, we got to get you on Pro Wrestling Tees. And I do think exclusivity is the key to everything. You know, it's, it's, it's how I base my star comic book business because the more exclusive something is, the less there are of it. And mm -hmm. I think that that, that makes 100% sense. And having an exclusive to it, 
I have shirt designs and I'm building out an entire t-shirt thing and certain designs are going to be exclusive to Redbubble uh, purposely because, you know, obviously that's what drives people to those places. Uh, but even going further, I've been saying this, I'm going to continue to say it, um, you have to support indie wrestlers. Um, and what that means is, you know, you have to actually buy their merch first and foremost. Um, as well as going to shows that they're on. So if you know a wrestler's on a show, you should go to that show, pick up a ticket, you know, whether you're sitting in the front row, the back row, the third row, it's still important to see wrestlers actually wrestle in person. But let's say that, you know, you are you can't make it to a show because it's 300 miles away. You should be watching on places like Cap TV, you know, on YouTube. Beyond is on IWTV. You know, a lot of other things that are on IWTV that you've been a part of. You know, Blitzkrieg is on Twitch. Um, and you should be watching those things and actually commenting, whether it's on Twitch or on Twitter, at your favorite wrestlers, tweeting at them, mentioning it on Facebook, sharing, you know, if something is going on on Twitch, share it on your Facebook page because it goes a long way. Um, and obviously, as I stated, buying merch is very important, especially at a show. It means something and it's very influential. But even when you're not at a show, if a wrestler drops a new shirt and you like the shirt, you should go buy it. If they have wristbands, go buy it. If they have eight by tens, go buy it. If they have buy me a coffee, consider donating. We got a PayPal link. All that stuff goes a long way because all that helps to subsidize, you know, what they're making from wrestling shows, as well as we've just went through 22 months of a very difficult time where wrestling shows were getting canceled left and right. And so a lot of people took a hit to income loss. So obviously all that stuff is very important. Again, follow people on social media, buy their merchandise. Um, as far as I am concerned with me, I'm an indie content creator. Obviously I have a sponsor. They're very helpful. I am right now in the process of trying to work out a Kickstarter that is being somewhat difficult that will either be resolved or I will be on Indiegogo at some point. Um, and so obviously I also have buy me a coffee. Uh, that link is up there. So if you like what I do, um, I appreciate people buying me a coffee, but more importantly than that, I buy me a coffee is very much like Patreon for those who are not interested, don't know what it is. Um, basically it's a way to say, Hey, I would like to see the show continue doing it some money. Um, and you can buy one, 10, 50 coffees. It's up to you guys to figure that out. Uh, but more importantly than that, um, please like, share, comment, because that's what I thoroughly enjoy is this being shared out, liked, commented. And if you're gonna spend money on me, go buy a shirt from Evil Kip Stevens, please. You know, Evil Kip, go, 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 go buy a shirt because, uh, you, know, you know, if I make money, he should make money too. So on that note, um, or better yet, if you would like, you could just give me your credit card and I'll share it with Kip for a while and uh, we'll take what we need out of the entire deal. A new TV would be greatly appreciated. I'm looking for a new Xbox. So uh, if you give me your credit card, you might get like a $1,200 bill, but you'll know I'll be happy. So, you know, one of us will be thrilled and the other will be stuck with a bill, but you'll know that you made somebody happy for the holidays. So <laughs> on that note, on that note, uh, Kip wants a TV. I want an Xbox. Uh, just give me your credit card and uh, we're good to go. We're good to go. So um, all jokes aside, though, uh, seriously support indie wrestling, sport indie content creators. And on that note, I'm going to give you the final word. I agree. Okay. So, so, so he, he agrees on his final word. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree with everything you said. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It was a great show. Uh, follow me on Twitter and Instagram and bug me if you want more Kip content. I will provide it then. And I think that's a wrap. <laughs>